at the end of Bushy's presentation, about 30 minutes on, and uh, my uh, judging panel are going to have to uh, sit down and make a decision and we'll announce the uh, winner of that prize. So, uh, so you've got about 30 minutes left if you, uh, if you still want to win the $50 voucher. Okay, um, so when we get to the questions and answers, are you going to give someone a microphone so everyone can hear the question? Or yeah. Yeah, yeah, we haven't got quite to that yet, but okay, we'll, we'll just go through a, few, uh, through a few of the real basic things with um, catching the duskies, but I'll keep uh, my end of it sort of short as far as, you know, ramming that stuff down your throat and then we'll leave it open to you to ask all the questions. I'm sure you've got plenty of questions that you'd like to ask and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, during that, that first bit of the presentation, you certainly would have um, picked up on the fact that when the soft plastic lures came on the scene, um, a lot more dusky flathead got caught, and that's, that's definitely a fact. Um, and some of what we learnt catching the duskies came from the brim tournaments as well. The fact that we used quite some quite small lures. Now, that's, that's a lure you'd probably associate a little bit more with brim fishing. It's only a two and a half inch grub. Um, that's a Z-Man two and a half inch grub and it's got about a two gram head on it, two gram ball head uh, of lead. Um, very simple fishing technique. These things have probably um, caused the death of more flathead than anything in the planet. Just your simple old, nowadays old egg beater reel, but I can remember going fishing with my dad when I was seven or eight years old in the Gippsland Lakes and all we had was a bag that you put down and you'd have the centre pin reel and pull all the line off on the bag and heave it out. Um, and when these things came along, the old man kept shaking his head. He said, oh, those automatic fish catchers, son, that'll be the death of fishing. And maybe he wasn't too far wrong. And he reckoned they were automatic fish catchers. But certainly um, on dusky flathead and brim, um, amazingly effective. And if you rig them up with braided line, which most of you will be doing already, um, that just adds the icing to the, to the cake. So that's your basic, I suppose. You know, it's nothing flash, that, that gear. It's just your basic, normal old six and a half, seven foot, um, fiberglass or carbon fibre rod, um, a medium sized egg beater, that's a two and a half thousand size. And if you fill that up with say six or eight pound braid, uh, bearing in mind that most of the braids break it way over what the, uh, what's written on the box. So that might sound a bit light when you're dealing with maybe a metre flatted if you're lucky. Or, you know, Gus is not that lucky, probably never get a metre one, but uh, you might, although I can tell you a story about Gus, he might, have, might be playing dead on the dusky flathead, but we went fishing down at Marlow one time for brim, and uh, I've caught the odd four pound brim in, in my time, so I'm ripping it into Gus because he'd never caught one. So I'm sort of mentioning the fact of how many I'd caught and how big and how good and how good I was. And, then, and I'd prep, you know, into him by saying, how many four pounders you caught, Gus? Oh yeah, that'd be zero. So anyway, so we go out. The first night I got a four pound one, full on measured four pound six, pretty good one. So we had to go back to the caravan park in Marlow and have a, have a couple of beers and uh, I was fairly unmerciful on him about how many of you caught now still four, oh no, you haven't gotten four pounders. So the next day we've got out there and he's caught one five pound eight in my boat. <laughs> so don't, don't be too uh, stirring up of gas, it doesn't work well. So now whenever we go brim fishing, I know what it is. How many five pounders you got, Bushy? None. All right, now we're off the track. So all right, you've got your uh, two and a half thousand size egg beater, six to eight pound braid, Braid's great because it casts a really, really long way um, and it cuts through the water really well. You'll need some form of a leader. Uh, duskies, they've got a habit of biting through leader and, and probably a little bit deserved because they do have teeth and if you've got a lot of pressure on them, they'll shake uh, and they will cut through your line. Um, but if you don't pull too hard on them, they don't generally do that soaring thing. And that, that rod, if you're not pulling too hard, it's only bent so much. When they shake their head and do the soaring thing, they don't get through your line. So we find that you catch more if you go fairly light in the leader department. Maybe that's probably about 12 pound leader. Um, having said that, you might get bitten off by a leader one <laughs> next week. But I think it outweighs that you hook more fish if you've got that bit lighter leader. Um, and just don't pull too hard. Don't panic when you see the size of a big dusky. Um, I generally find panic works all right because I always panic when I hook a big dusky, but anyway. And you'll, you'll know straight away because when you're throwing these plastics out, probably the most common way to fish it is you just heave it out there and you're doing a reasonably smart lift up with the rod so that that lure will go down to the bottom and then you give it those two flicks and it'll hop off the bottom like some startled prawn or shrimp or whatever. And then you drop your rod tip back down and that'll just tip over and swim back down to the bottom. 
and that's when the dusky you'll always eat it. Very rarely ever eat it on the flick, or if you're just winding it in, you're never going to get one. So flick it up, get his attention. It comes up three or four feet off the bottom, then it tips over and goes to swim down. Clunk, dusky will grab hold of it. And when he does, if you're watching your line, probably a metre from the water, you'll get that flick. The line will just flick like a marsh flies run into it or something. It just goes like that and then it stops. You don't get any big run, but it's just, and you know it, something's eating it, probably dusky. So you just tighten up on the dusky, put a bit of a bend in the rod and that barbless hook will go straight into him. And if he's a really big one, you know in the first two seconds because your rod goes and you go, oh dear, here we go, we're in trouble. So then you've just got to play him really gently. That's the big trick with the big ones. Don't panic. He's got, he won't go too far. He'll just have a couple of runs, a few thrashes. But if you really panic and fight hard, that makes him go worse and he might saw through you then. So this system's pretty deadly. Uh, and as I say, that little lure, even though we normally would associate it as being a small lure for a dusky flathead, I've just seen so many big flathead caught on that size lure. Um, and some people come up to me and say, how the hell can I catch a, a flathead? I can't get one. And I think of myself and Chris Ryder, I know we fished in Mallacoota in one brim tournament and a brim is a bad demerit. And I think we caught 65 flathead or something trying to catch brim. So if you've got one of these things in the water and you keep letting it go down the bottom and flick it up, if there's one there, you're going to catch it. Uh, and if you haven't done a lot of it or people that haven't done a lot of it, all I'd say is just set it up like this, and if you go for an hour without catching one, don't worry about it. If I go for an hour without catching one, that's pretty normal. I just go, okay, haven't caught one for an hour. I know I'm doing the right thing. Either I wasn't in the right place, or the fish that are there aren't turned on and going to bite. It doesn't bother me. I just go for another hour. And if you ask me, this is probably another hour and another hour and another hour. <laughs> but eventually, if you're just keeping that, do, doing that same dumb thing, you're going to go clunk eventually. And what will tend to happen is they'll be bunched up in one area, and you won't only go clunk once, you'll probably just go clunk, clunk, clunk. And then you go, oh, I've had a terrific day. But if someone asks you, um, you know, oh, I've had a great day, caught 20, 20 flathead. I might have caught none for four hours. But if you're just starting out and you happen to crack that four hours when you get catch none, well, the mind plays tricks on you and you go, oh, I'm doing it wrong. I can't do it. Or I can't catch them. This, you know, lures are no good, whatever else. No, not probably true. So there's your basic, most basic setup um, for catching them. Now, there are a million other ways to do it, um, I guess. Um, and again, on, on any given day, it pays to have those other strings to your bow. All right, let's, and this is just my normal junk that I would take fishing. I haven't sort of done anything special for you or rigged anything up unusual. So that's a box of vibes. Um, these ones are um, carbon. Uh, they're not... Uh, they're plastic, basically. So they're just a little fish-shaped vibe with a piece of weight on the front. Um, get down to the bottom quite quickly, and they do quite a violent shake when you lift them up. So they're a little bit different to the plastic. Some days the plastic reigns supreme and everything bites the plastic. Other days, this violent sort of a, an action really attracts the dusky. So not that unusual to have a day where the plastic doesn't really do it, but this will. Uh, so it pays to have a couple of strings to your bow. Um, I wouldn't find it unusual to get a whole lot on that and nothing on that, <coughs> or the opposite, nothing on that and a whole lot on the other one. But they're my two go-to lures probably for duskies. Um, apart from those, there are lots of other things we can do. Just have a look here. Hard-bodied lures are certainly right on the money and I carry a fair box full of hard body lures. You've all seen various types of these. We've got every known brand and shape. That's a thing called a die with double clutch. That works really well. Um, that one's a jackal chubby. That works well too. But you have to get used to the various different retrieves that work on these different lures too. Like if you've got that long skinny lure with the bib, we generally crank it till it dives down. Maybe probably get down to about six feet realistically. So if you're fishing in water yay deep, you just chuck the thing out, wind it down till it's down near the bottom and then just give it a few jerks and let it float and it'll slowly want to come up. Just another couple of jerks, it'll come up and then mostly while, while you're not giving it the jerk and just letting it come up, the flatty will grab it and away it'll go. So that is a really good technique. Um, strangely enough, these little chubbies, they're more 
Well, I think they were probably designed as a largemouth bass lure in America. It's a jackal's and probably an American company. But that works really well just on a steady retrieve. So that's a really easy lure to use if you've got kids or you just haven't been doing much of it yourself. Again, you can do this land base just walking around in the shallows knee deep because a lot of them uh, and throwing out a little bit deeper water for the flatties because they will lie in shallow water. Or more commonly, you can use those all this, these techniques out of a boat. Um, don't need a complicated electric motor to catch duskies or anything. It sometimes helps, but mostly you just turn your boat side on, drift with the breeze, always throw with the wind because it's a hell of a lot easier. Just throw with the wind so you can get distance and then just do all these different techniques and try a few different lures and you're going to catch duskies. Um, I suppose you know I could probably talk for a week and I'd probably forget half the things that you really want to know. So we might just um, throw it open to a few questions and uh, we don't really mind, do we, Craig, what questions come? Any, any question you like about anything, if I've got an answer, I'll give it to you. And if I haven't got an answer, I'll say don't know. So fire away. Yeah, look, that's one thing that it is worth worth using. Ah, uh, you fair bit there'll be some in top of this box. Uh, now, normally when I was working for that, yeah, so you nearly always use the scent. I've been in the boat with it. Yeah, I do. I used to work work for Shimano, and that's a, a product developed by Shimano. I don't work for Shimano anymore. They figured out I was no good after about fifteen years and gave me the flick. So I'm not working for anyone at the moment. So anything I tell you is unbiased. But that is a really good product. That um, squidgy scent uh, works really well. Um, it wasn't, it's not just a gimmick. A lot of the scents are. But this was, they, the company got a fishery scientist to develop that scent. And his main job was to, in the aquaculture industry, and he was designing pellets and building pellets to get fish from, when they first hatched out, they feed on the little rotifers and things. And the difficult stage they have with a lot of fish in aquaculture is getting them from that stage to eating pellets it's difficult so his job was to make the pellets as attractive and you know as possible so that a bigger percentage of the fish at that young age would switch over and eat the pellet mix so that was his actual job is putting uh, additives that make fish eat basically so that was a big project and the first thing he did when he made this scent they had fish in in a tank they did it on Bribey Island in a big um, research thing it was a pretty pretty expensive process the first thing he did was get these fish that mostly they used brim, snapper, and they had some uh, mulloway. And they got all the current scents that are available on the market and they poured the scent in and then fed the fish. And it was pretty interesting because some of the American scents, they put it in and the fish went away and hid for two days. <laughs> so good luck if you bought that stuff. I think it was lunk of paste or something it was. Uh, gulp was pretty good, the smell of that gulp lure, that, that brought the fish out. And by the time he'd finished making this scent, and put it on some rubber and threw it in there, they'd swallow the rubber and they didn't spit it out. So he knew that. So yeah, scent is really good. And that's one I know works, even though I don't make any money out of it, which I wish I did. <laughs> right. Okay, another question. Sure. Who's got one? Yep. Does the colour of the lure make much difference? Yes and no. <laughs> yeah, look, colours are colours are very a very interesting thing. I think quite a lot of the time the colour doesn't make all that much difference. Um, but there's days when it makes absolutely a difference. Uh, and I've seen that happen far too many times to, to discount it. Uh, and not only a colour, it'll be a shade of a colour that'll make a difference. We already know from you know, scientists dissecting the eyes of fish that they see in colour very well, and they see more colours than we see. Um, and it's an important thing in the fish world, colour. So yes, the colour of your lure does make a hell of a difference sometimes. Um, and we know that because if I'm fishing with, with my mates, the thing that mostly you want to go fishing with your mates for is to kick their bums. That's obvious. You don't want to, you know, let them give you a hard time, especially Gus. So you're always looking at what your mate's doing, whether you think, you know, whether, whether you're admitting it or not. And as soon as someone gets one or two fish in front, you're looking at that lure and going, is that the green one or is that the brown one? So yeah, colour makes, I've found quite a lot of the time, a very big difference. Um, dusky flathead. I've got two colours that I normally use and in that motor oil grub, which I also make no money out of, unfortunately, um, that motor oil Z-Man grub is a very good one and then that's a bright green and it's got a lot of UV in it, which makes a difference to fish. And then there's other days when something, you know, pumpkin seed, real nondescript, dark colour like the squidgy lures we used to make, the bloodworm colour, although they made 57,000 bloodworm colours, 
Um, I just about had to buy a piece of rope working for that company. But uh, yeah, so colour makes a difference. That's the short answer. Um, couldn't tell you exactly why, but fish are, fish are weird. And, and when it does make a difference, it is, it's really bad if, you, if you're fishing a hard body lure and your mate's got the one that's the right colour and you don't have because it's not going to keep happening once. It's just, just, he's just going to keep catching them and you're not. So there's things you can do, like when he's not looking, you just slice the spool a bit with the, with the knife and then he goes, oh, bloody hell, look at that. So there are ways around colour, but um, yeah, it is important. Right, who's got another question? Yep. How tight should the drag be? How tight should the drag be? Um, well, just tight enough really to, to set the hook is a good start. Um, there you go. I'll give you a feel of this drag. And that was just, that's just how it comes. There you go. You hang on to that and I'll be the, I'll be the flathead. Although I'm probably a bit uglier than a flathead, but anyway. Right, you're right, you're on. So I just set it like that for a start. Not very heavy. But as soon as you hook that fish up, you generally lose fish in the first two minutes of the fight or the last two minutes. So if you get your drag wound up too tight and a big dusky gets on the end and goes and you're hanging on going, oh, bloody hell, it'll, it, you can bust him in the first couple of bits. But once, you, once he's on there with that lighter drag, then you can wind it up and, you know, just reasonable. So there's no exact uh, amount, but you can soon find out because if you've busted a couple off in the row, I'll bet you your drag was too tight. <laughs> so, so don't do that again. It's a fairly self-correcting industry, this fishing industry. Um, if something stuffs up, you've got to do it another way. So, yeah, not, not really too tight. Um, and especially with duskies, don't, don't pull on them too hard. All right, if there's a, an oyster rack in the road and a big dusky's going full on towards it, okay, you've got no choice. You've got to wind it up and hang on to either you or it. But if you're out in the open, take your time. Don't have too much drag. Should you ask this question before you went out fishing this morning? Yeah. Um, I haven't got the whiting box. That's too secret. I can't show anyone. But um, look, these things called. Um, uh, we use them. Use them. Yeah, they just. But uh, this, it's pretty tricky. There's good ones and bad ones. I got to think of the name of the thing. Uh, I use it every day. God, it's gone out of my head. Oh, I just, no, I really, it really has. No, it really has. I'm trying to think of it. Sugar pen. Yeah, Mega Bass Sugar Pen. That's what, that's what you buy. There's two sizes. A big one about oh, 85 or something, I think it is. And the other one's about 65. I'll show you, but I, I'll show you, but I haven't got the, yeah, I haven't got the whiting box. Because really, um, I mean, we've caught quite a lot of duskies over the years fishing for other fish like tailing and stuff on surface lures. But I know in New South Wales with these yellowfin whiting, we're doing a hell of a lot of that poppering in shallow water. And not unusual to get half a dozen, sometimes more good duskies in the shallows on the surface. And man, when they hit it, I'm, I'm not kidding, they cartwheel right out of the water sometimes. So you're seeing a thing this long, cartwheel and get clear of the water, it's, it's a pretty good buzz. So Sugar Pan in 617, it's a clear colour with red stripes. Uh, they, just on that, uh, my son caught one on a jitterbug fish at the bass. Yeah. Coming off the edge of a uh, sand drop off. And uh, he thought, yeah, this is what's this, and it was on a on a on a surface paddler, so yeah. quite an interesting catch, and it was a fairly good size one too. Yeah, and asking me about the cod lures, I think if you did put a couple of cod lures across some of those shallow drop-offs, you, if you did it long enough, you're going to get a hell of a fright. Some some big dusky's going to come and climb on it, for sure. Right, uh, who's got another question? There must be one hidden up there. Uh, yep. Where were we? Uh, we've got a question from Facebook Live. Um, so they want to know, have you had more luck casting into the shallows, bringing it into the deeper water, or deep into shallow? Oh, well, probably, probably both. But if I'm in the boat, usually you're doing the, the slightly deeper bit throwing into the shallows, which works really well. But a lot of the times we will be wading, so you don't have much of a choice. You can only get sort of so far in. Uh, and I'm pretty cowardly. I don't get it above knee deep. It's too deep in any water, I reckon. Um, Look, in a boat, generally casting in towards the shallows because the shallows are a really underrated uh, place to fish, especially for duskies. And big duskies will lie in water that deep quite, quite happily. So I suppose if I had to make an answer, I'd say, yeah, throwing into the shallows is pretty good. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yep. Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so far, I've gone all day and haven't upset too many people. <laughs> uh, look, I, I suppose I, I prefer Cooter because it's closer to me. I mean, uh, and I'm not going to say Lake Tyres because Gus will kill me because you already reckon there's too many people fishing in Lake Tyres. He's thinking a total closure except for anyone associated with the fisheries board, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, look, I, I like Cooter because it's big and I've fished it forever and it's close to me. It's only an hour from my door pretty much to go and fish Cooter. But um, I have fished um, in, in, yeah, down here pretty successfully, especially in the past. I used to come down and sneak on the big flatties um, in the winter. And there's, yeah, there's, it was always fantastic. So uh, I haven't fished down here for a while. But, um, yeah, no, I'm not allowed to say it's good. Gus won't let me. Probably Cooter. Any more questions? Must be something. Yeah. Now that uh, slack water low, low tide was appeared in that St George River where they the fish then turn and on and look like they're feeding a lot more. Yeah. Do you have any experiences about tides and things? Um, not so much. I I probably should because I, I know all that data is quite relevant and, and I'm sure it's a fact. But I tend to regard the tides a little bit like the Maori the Maori um, black fishing day, good fishing day type thing, the almanac. My mates stay home and garden or something when it's a black day and I go, well, stuff that, I'm going fishing, you know, and sometimes I catch plenty of fish on the black day. So my idea is if you don't have to work for that particular day and you don't have to go shopping or some other horrible thing that occasionally occurs and, and you've got from dawn till dark and if you go, well, you're going to crack a couple of good tide periods along the way. So I fish hard from, from dawn till dusk and somewhere along the line, but I think it's absolutely correlates to me. Yeah, look, tide changes I, I find super important, um, and it's strangely enough, it doesn't seem to matter for what Craig will probably have the same thing with me. Catch a lot of barramundi and stuff. Even if you're in a lake of Wonga, which has got a wall between it and the ocean, it's pretty close to the ocean, but it's got a wall between. Barrels will bite on the change of tide. There's no tide in there. Nothing's moving. Doesn't matter to them. It's a change of tide. I they think know. It's more of a moon phase, which drives the tide. Yeah, so they know. They know when the change of tide is and they'll bite on it. So uh, even when an estuary's closed, and Jewies as well, we find that. And um, a bloke called Shane Mensor, some of you might have read some of his stuff over the years, been around the fishing industry a long, a long time. He writes um, the, or edits the South Australian magazine. And um, I said to him one day, look, I, I don't know, I might be nuts, but I'm, I'm catching a few of these Jewies and the joint's landlocked, but I keep catching them dead on the change of tide. And he just laughed and he says, well, how long's it taking you to work that out? You know, so, you know, it's... The fish, no. So, yes, I agree with everything that you scientists guys have come up with. It makes sense to me. But I don't take any notice of it. I go fishing as early as I can get out there and I stay as late as I can because I've, I've had some hell of a good days and in, in places I shouldn't have been and in tides that should be shit house. Like, I mean, mates, well, some of them are really dictated to by their diaries and by all their stuff and they go, oh, this time last year, that tide, when it was three quarters of the way in, these Jewies bit and they did whatever. And, and I come home and go, yeah, I've got a couple. And I go, oh, yeah, right on that change of tide. I go, no, you're fair in the middle of the day when there's nothing happening. Oh, they just, if you, my Bushy's rule of fishing is if you can, you just go fishing. You know, <laughs> that's how it is. I'm not very scientific. I'm just too dumb to go home. That's what I've caught a few fish. <laughs> you know, I know, there must be another complicated question someone's got. Yeah, internet-y question. Uh, how good am I going on the internet? I don't even know how you turn it on. I've got a question from Facebook Live from Simon Carter. He wants to know... Um, he says, in Queensland, pink is a very successful colour. Um, has that been the case down your way? Yeah, you bet. The pink is a really good colour. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't absolutely tell you why. Um, brim, estuary perch, uh, big flatties. Uh, one of those photos I had was one of my favourite lures. It's just a full-on pink <laughs> glowing um, rubber lure. And you, you, there's not too much swimming around in there that's glowing pink, I don't think. But uh, maybe it's just a visibility thing. Um, Certainly you can see that stuff further away. And what I've always suspected, because look, there's other rules that no one's asked me that question, but people often ask me the question, they say, do you have a bright lure on a bright day or a dull lure on a dull day, and dull day or you know, the opposite, and I just look at them stupid, I put a bright one on it. If that catches them, that's good, it stays on it. If it doesn't catch them, you put it in the box and put the dark one on it and maybe that catches them. Um, but yeah, I'm, I agree with that guy. The bright pink lures are very, very good on duskies, absolutely. Maybe a visibility thing. If they're on the chew anyway and they're out on the prowl and they see something a bit further away or they see it a bit easier, I think that may be what it is. But 
anyone that tells you they really know how a fish brain works, I think they're, they're having a line here, because I don't. That's for sure. But yeah, it's a good thing. Pink's good. Thanks. Two, two questions, Bushy. The yep. first one is, do you think flatheads um, get used to particular lures or not? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do. Look, worldwide, what, what research has been done, and, and certainly anecdotal type evidence, very, very difficult to fish a, a species into extinction with, with a lure because firstly what happens I think is if it's hard, a hard fished fishery and you're killing the fish that, you, that you're catching and you have one type of lure, all the fish that are susceptible to that lure get, get killed. All right. The ones that that lure's gone past them for whatever reason, and fish personalities do vary, if that lure hasn't been attractive to a certain subspecies or subset of those fish, those fish don't react to that lure. So I don't know whether they get used to it, but that lure becomes less effective over time. Absolutely. And I can tell you the brim in Malacuta, when we first started lure fishing, probably, I don't know, would have been probably 25 years ago, fishing with lures for brim in, in Malacuta, if you saw one sneaking along a rock wall or sticking his tail out and flapping it, if you threw any goddamn thing that could swim, no matter who made it, within three feet of that brim, it would turn its head up, swim over there and eat the lure. But after umpteen brim comps and people like me or other people going down there hammering them with lures, now you usually throw it in there, there'll be three of them sticking their tails out the water and they go, oh, one of them, fair enough. <laughs> Not going to go over there and eat it. So that, certainly old fish, fish that live a long time, have got good memories. They're not goldfish. Brim aren't goldfish. They remember stuff. So yes, they do either get lures, uh, get used to lures, or certainly the lures can become less effective. Uh, yeah, brimmer, brimmer fussy. Oh, oh yeah, we're talking duskies. I, I still think yes. Uh, both those... Both those things I think apply to duskies, either all the duskies that were susceptible to your, to your whatever type of lure it was, whether it was a Mr Twister or something else, maybe you've cleaned a big number of those out and the ones that were originally not attracted to that lure are still in the system. So yeah, occasionally, and you come up with a brand new, new, new lure that those fish haven't seen, it can be very deadly for a while. So you don't want to buy a bag of 100 Mr Probably, well, yeah, well, you might if there's a tailor breeding program going on. but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, look, I, I don't know the full full answer, but I do know that lures become less effective and then at times you come across a new lure. Like when these vibes first came out, it was 100 fish a day in Mallacoota. Like it was it was complete madness. We were, we were thrown in there. You'd either get a brim or a, or a flatty, most casts. Like Gus, Gus was with me one day and, and I don't know how many we caught, but it would be 100. It was ridiculous. But gradually over time, they either we, well, we were letting ours go, so maybe they learnt. But that lure now is is okay. It's a part of the arsenal, but it's not it's not the mad killer that it was for the first few months we used it. The other question is: Do you have a theory for why you know like one in ten flatheads deflected could have? Uh, no, I don't know. And different systems. Uh, that's certainly uh, what I've noticed with flathead eating quality of flathead in, in different systems varies a hell of a lot. Like some fish don't seem to vary very much. Um, Wherever you catch them, they taste pretty much the same. Brim seem to vary a lot with whatever system. Some will be really, you can't even eat them, they taste that bad, and other systems they're pretty good. Flathead, I don't know why that is. One of the scientists that here may know why the, the flesh is different, but you can catch one flathead with one cast, and when you go home and fill it, it'll have that nice greyish, whitish meat that tastes beautiful. The other one will have that orangey meat, and it's, it's you know, your missus gets that bit, or, you know. <laughs> Your son, someone, someone else, you don't, you don't eat that bit. So I don't know why that is. Maybe they're eating different food or... Uh, I always sort of thought it was because they might be in the muddy environment and you get the other ones closer to the front, but I've, I've caught them side by side. And the thing is, if you knew, it'd be great because you could let that one go, but you don't know until you're filling them. No, I can't. I can't work it out. So don't know. Maybe one of our scientist guys might know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you keep all the orange ones. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No. Probably, but I, I I don't know. And it's not so much a small thing or a big thing. You can get a reasonable size one. Uh, yeah. Don't know the answer to that one. Yep. Lauren, did you want to go first or? Yep. Um, we've got another question um, from Adam Turner. Should more be done to promote catch and release? Oh, that's a good question. Look, we've probably, it's probably been promoted reasonably well. As we've all sort of discussed here, I think 
I don't think anyone is any, in any disagreement that we need to use it as a tool. Uh, the only thing we probably need to do is explain it a little bit more uh, so that when people are releasing them, we already, we already know from the various studies that the catch and release is fairly effective. When, when you're saying 90% plus are going to live with the, our current methods, that's, that's pretty worthwhile. But I still think, um, well, as I said, when I, when I released those ones for the aquarium, I got 100% out of 35 fish for, for three months afterwards. So if we could just improve our game a little bit in explaining to most people uh, the finer points, if you like, of releasing it in a little bit better condition, um, you know, with the internet and stuff, maybe we do a few short little things and stick on the internet, you know, we could probably do a bit of damage that way. So um, maybe just promote it a little bit uh, better, I would say better catch and release maybe, yeah. Um, my question is um, about live bait. Do you use live bait when you're fishing? We've heard about your lures. Uh, I don't, but I, I have done and it's very effective. If you'd like to use the live bait, it works very, very well. Um, uh, look, one, I think I can catch more fish on lures than I can on live bait in most situations because with the live bait, if I'm standing there with that rod and I'm standing right here, I can fish every foot of this room with 30 casts or 40 casts without without moving. If I'm fishing a live bait effectively, I'm putting it out there and it's swimming around and it's more attractive to the flathead than my lure, but the flathead's got to be in a cer certain radius of that live bait to swim over there and eat it. Whereas I'm in my boat and I'm here, I've fished all that area in about 20 or 30 casts, then I move my boat, drift it along another 100 feet and then I'm, I've fished another bit. And if you work out how much ground my lure has covered reasonably effectively for that day, put it this way, if I'm fishing for my life or my son's life or something, I'm using a plastic, I'm not using a live bait. But if you like sitting in the boat, putting a live bait out there and having a relax and waiting to get a fish, it's, it's still a very effective way. And it's probably a very effective way if you're using big live baits and you want to target a really big fish, it's going to work. But the other thing is like I'm... I'm probably a bit of a bloodthirsty killer. I love eating fish and I will kill them, but I like to kill them as quickly and humanely as I can because I don't, I sort of don't like death much, you know, I'm not good at it. I'd hate things when they die and even I feel squeamish about killing anything, you know, even fish. Well, I shouldn't say even fish, they've got every right to be as good as anything else, but um, I don't like killing them. So if I, if I can catch a fish on a lure that only lives in a packet or I've got to go and kill one fish to catch another fish, um, I'm not big on it, you know, so I, I, I sort of like lures. I'm not saying I'm not a, not bloodthirsty, but I, I'd rather kill less things than more things, if, if you know what I mean. Any more questions? Yep. Lauren? Okay, um, another question from Facebook Live. Um, any guidance on how to bait fish for flathead to prevent cut hooking them? Yeah, use a lure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, no, look, well, uh, seriously, use a barbless hook. Because if you're bait fishing with a barbless hook, even if it swallowed it, all you've got to do is put your long nose pliers on and it's as easy as that. You just go and it's straight out. No trauma, no ripping its guts, no hanging on to it tightly. I just can't say enough. If you're bait fishing and you're using a dead set barbless hook, man, I can't tell you scientifically how much better chance it's got, but I know it's heaps better. Yeah, it's a lot better. Thanks. So, yeah, use a lot of your barbless. Yeah, circle's good. I'm going to ask a bait related question. Yeah. Um, and I agree with what you're saying there, coverage and so forth. But uh, cast nets in Victoria, this is a fishery question. Uh, cast nets, spray nets for uh, catching the live baits. Well, they're illegal. Yeah. yeah. They're illegal. Uh, Why? <laughs> mainly mainly because of the trout. I think I can answer that one because you can walk up a trout stream and catch every trout you can see. Yeah. There's no, not, not many in Queensland where you can use one. I don't think there's too many states. I, I think the, uh, the reason is, is, is a, yeah, um, a number of those techniques are not, are not just for catching bait. So, you know, like I've done a fair bit of uh, you know, fishing in Northern Territory and Northern Australia. And, uh, you know, like you, you quite co commonly catch legal size bear in a cast net when you, you know, like where there's a school of bait, you know, along the edge of the bank. So, in, you know, in... You could potentially, like, if you're pretty good with a cast net, and there are schools of, you know, fish which you're out there angling for, you could potentially uh, really do some damage to it fairly quickly. So I think it's more about that efficiency. I, yeah. you, know, I you know, like the the original reason it might have been. For, I think originally uh, it probably you know, was, but I mean, some of those issues like you know, fish that aren't feeding, you can catch them with a cast net. It's, well, put it's this way, Joe, I just don't think don't think we need one. I don't think you need one. That's 
Yeah. Well, they're pretty small uh, drag nets, and, uh, and while they're fairly, they're, they're really more efficient for for bait, bait you know. Um, and it's it's more probably yeah. um, and a, but plus no. a bait net moves. I mean, a pull net moves pretty slowly. You don't get many brim and stuff like that in it. But when a cast net hits, it goes. Choo! You catch all sorts, you know. That's crazy. It's not unusual to catch barrels. Not unusual to catch crocodiles as well, which is pretty pretty fun when you got to pull on the rope and there's a fairly big pull on the other end of it. Yeah, I, I just had an interesting. Well, don't worry, I'd love to have one in my car for catching potty malt, don't worry, but I'm not going to go out there and catch everything else and I haven't got as much faith in the rest of the human population. Well, I, I do <laughs> think examples of people in the world's cast are running in the world's cast. Here's an example, we've put a cast in, in the dial to try to catch some live bait down the bottom of the, the daily and, uh, and we have ten barramundi in one cast. Um, most of the small ones, yeah. but there was there was one big one in, in that. So that, and that's really yeah. they are very efficient. We need the good bloke rule. You have to go to the fisheries, apply for a permit. If you're a good bloke, you're allowed to use a cast net. <laughs> no, it's you're pretty not. easy. <laughs> no, you're not. Should be easy. Yeah, not a problem. No, we'll not. sort you out, Joe. You'll be right. <laughs> all right. Not a problem. Uh, any further questions? Except for Gus, he's not allowed to use one because he would run a muck. I was just testing the environment. Yeah, right. Okay. If there's no further questions. No further questions, Your Honour. Going. It's your last on. chance. If you've got a question, you've been sort of yeah, sitting on. All Must day. have one more this question. Come on, one I'm going to feel bad if I don't get another question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not really for me because I'm covering so much ground. Uh, really, when you're burly, you're bringing fish to you. But I don't really know where the duskies are. Would they come from burly? It's a question I don't know the answer to. You're supposed to ask a question. I could look clever answering. Um, yeah, I don't question. know. I don't know the answer to that either. Yeah, I don't know whether anyone does. I wouldn't be surprised. Most predators will come up for a smell. So if you were if you were live baiting and you had a bit of burley, I don't think you'd do your, ha your chances any harm. Put it that way. Uh, I don't know. That's the real real well, answer. And often the burley is about tracking the, the, the small bait fish. Which if you're tracking the bait fish, you know, fish like like duskies, yeah. predatory fish, uh, wouldn't hurt you. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, 